So if you got your Bibles, let's pull them out right now. And turn to me, or excuse me, turn to uh, the book of Romans, specifically Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll be coming from Romans chapter 8. And once you get to Romans chapter 8, let's, uh, let's have everyone just say amen. Romans chapter 8. Is everyone there? Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Romans chapter 8. So this is something that I've been working on for a while. Um, just the Lord has, has laid this on my heart. And this is a teaching that I, that I came across, and I've done a lot of studying in it, and I've seen a lot of fruit from it. And so I want to share the same teaching with you as well. So I want to build upon this, upon this teaching. And so I'm, I'm calling this teaching of this sermon, uh, Keeping in Step with the Spirit. You can also call it Walking with the Spirit. I like to call it Keeping in Step with the Spirit. So from today up until the next time that I teach, again, this is the foundation. I want to talk about staying spiritually minded. Not just spiritually minded with our words, but also spiritually minded with our actions as well. Because we serve a King of Kings and a Lord of Lords. Right? He has gone past the cross and is on the throne. I'll say that again. Amen. He has gone past the cross and is on the throne. Amen. He's seated on the right hand. Amen. 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 So within this in this teaching. Uh, something that I want I want to include, or that I will include, is dreams, visions, and interpretations of that, and also tongues as well. So we have the opportunity to pray in our heavenly language, and through prayer in our heavenly language, we can receive revelation, and we can use that revelation, or rather interpret those tongues, and then God can reveal something to us. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's say, for example, if, if you're having some, some challenges or difficulties at work or in school, in your marriage, whatever relationship you may be a part of, please know that you can go to your Heavenly Father anytime. And you can go to Him in many different ways. You can go to Him in your natural language, or you can go to Him in your heavenly language and speak in your heavenly language, and He can give you that revelation. And when we speak in tongues, with the intent to receive that revelation, so interpretation of that, whenever you do so, you want to write down the first thing that comes to mind. Don't think about it. Don't try to reason with it, with your human mind. First thing that comes to mind, you write it down. And it's the same way with, um, similar with dreams and visions. So the Bible talks a lot about dreams and visions. And dreams and visions, open visions or inner visions, God uses to speak to his people. And if there is one thing that God is trying to do, and that the body of Christ, the church, we really need to continue to move in that direction expeditiously now, is hearing the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God. Amen. Amen. We are at a peak season of our lives. We are at a peak season in this nation where we, the, the body of Christ needs to hear the voice of God in the Lord. And not just in this nation, but in nations around. I don't want to go too much on a rabbit trail, but when you look at different nations around us, like Afghan or uh, Iraq and Iran, the things that are happening there uh, with the Muslim culture, there is a lot of Muslims being converted through a divine interaction with God through dreams and visions into Christians. Yes, sir. They are the number one growing fastest church. And it's happening in a country who is not predominantly Christian. But here in the States, we have a problem with stepping our game up. We have a problem with placing God in the box. And so we have other countries who are stepping their game up, who are moving quickly and, and, and literally dying for Jesus. 
dying for Jesus. If these people are caught praying for someone or worshiping Jesus, they could die. They are placing their lives on the line for Jesus. And here in the States, what do we do? Oh, I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want everybody to somewhat know that I like Jesus. You know, you know what? There's that, there's that person with that cane and that walker. I'm not going to pray for them. I don't want you know, to rough them any feathers. And why don't you want to rough them any feathers? You got the word of God backing you up. The word of God said you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's it. Yes, sir. You shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The word shall is probably one of the strongest words in the English language. There's no vacillating with the word shall. That's what it is. And the word of God says that. But here in the States, we don't want to rough many feathers. But you have people in third world countries who are dying for Jesus, dying to get the word of God. And they are being impacted by Jesus through dreams and visions. So God is speaking to them. And if God can speak to them, you know what that means? God wants to speak to you. Yes, well. sir. Yes, Amen. sir. Amen. Amen. Through dreams and visions and tongues and interpretations of those tongues. Amen. And who doesn't? Who doesn't? Whether, whether you are in ministry or not, and technically, everyone is in ministry, right? You are part of the body of Christ. You have a duty. Mark 16 says that, the Great Commission, that you should go out to all the world and preach the gospel. Yes, sir. So the king has already spoken. Amen. So, for lack of terms, if you are not in ministry, if you just say, hey, you know what? I just work a job. I work at a factory. Uh, I'm a school teacher. That's great. Who doesn't want to be able to hear from their father accurately through dreams, visions, tones, and interpretation of those tones to be able to make the right decision? To be able to have someone come to you with a business opportunity and instead of jumping right into it just because they throw money in your face, you say, you know what? Let me take some time. Let me pray about it. And then you go home and you pray in your, in your heavenly language. You pray in your heavenly language. And then you get the revelation. You go back to him the next day. You know what? No. I'll pass. Because your father's trying to tell you something. Yeah. He's trying to tell you don't do that. Your father, it, through dreams, vision, and, and tongues, your father can even tell you who to date and who not to date. Yeah. Amen. Who to marry and who not to marry. No daughter. That young man is not right for you. <laughs> no, my son. That young lady is too fast for you. All right. <laughs> Listen. You're right. teaching. That's good. I, I can stop right here. <laughs> is this thing on? It's on. Is it on? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Your Heavenly Father wants to speak to you through dream, vision, and tongues and interpretations of tongues. Amen? Amen. All right. So, when, 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 when discovering this, one of the things, obviously, that I thought of my rational mind was well, Jesus never talked about dreams. Right. Jesus didn't specifically talk about dreams. But he also said that you can do these works in prayer. And then also in the book of John, chapter 21, at the end, uh, verse 25, talked about Jesus did many more works than this book can describe. But that can be written down in any of the, in all the books in the world. As a matter of fact, the book of Matthew starts off as a dream. There is six different times, probably more, in the book of Matthew where it talks about in a dream, in a dream, in a dream. Dreams are important. And we must be able to interpret those dreams because God is trying to speak to us. Now, one thing, I want, one, one thing I do want to say is that not every dream is from God. Let's make this clarification. Right. Not every dream is from God. There are some times where it can be a very soulish dream or even demonic dreams. And I don't want to spill things before uh, next Sunday because I'm really going to dive deep into this next Sunday. But when we think about nightmares, if you have, usually nightmares are, are soulish, meaning something demonic. Right. 
usually if you have a nightmare where you are running or being chased by something, usually that means you're, you're running from an inner fear. There's an inner fear that is happening, you're running from it, and it's chasing you. Now, don't limit the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit can definitely work through that and also show you how to combat that, because God will give you dreams of how to combat certain things. Amen. So, dreams and interpretations, people. It's biblical, and it's important that the body of Christ needs to hear this message, especially in a time like this. All right, let's dig in. Romans chapter 8. So I want to start with uh, verse 13. Verse 13 says, For if you live accordingly to the flesh, you will die. But, I love the word but, the, but, the word but in the English language is conjunction. Meaning that what I say was important, but what I'm about to say right now is even more important. So, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, if by the Spirit you put to the death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let me read that again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But, it's a conjunction, what I just said was important, but what I'm about to say is even more important. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Let's stop right there. I want you to underline uh, the words. I'm reading from the New King James. So depending on what translation or manuscript you are using, you may say something different. Let's uh, underline the words led by, and then also let's underline the word sons. So again, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The, in the Greek, um, that, that word, those words led by, translates to uh, constantly. So you can make a note in your Bible that is constantly. So the word led by in, this, in the Greek means constantly. And then the second word that I have you underline is the word sons. And the word sons means a couple different things. So when we think about the Greek language, the Greek language is a very colorful language. Um, and unfortunately, our English language doesn't necessarily give us the full interpretation of the Greek language. As a side note, I just want to say that um, you know, it's, it's good to, to really study these things out. So a couple of texts that I like to use uh, besides my Bible. Um, I like to use a Dates Bible. I also like to use a Kenneth Reese Greek translation, New Testament Greek translation. Um, and then I also have a study Bible as well that I can search specific words, keywords, to give me the definition if I'm looking in the Old Testament, it gives, it gives it to me in Hebrew. If I'm looking in the New Testament, it gives it to me in Greek. So it's good to kind of study these things out because they bring about a different uh, flavor, just a different light to these words and to the scriptures, and you can really understand what these scriptures say. So the, the Greek, uh, again, is a very colorful language, and it doesn't really express how uh, the English would express certain words. Uh, especially here with the words of sons. So it's the word sons in the, in, in the English would just translate as, as sons, okay? But in the Greek, there are a couple different definitions that the word sons are translated to, okay? So there is, there's about four, you might wanna write these down. Uh, first one, the word sons can translate to is the word infant first translation is infant. The second word that sons can translate to would be toddler. Be toddler. The third translation that uh, sons um, have would be adolescent, or another word would be teenager. So we have three, we have infant, toddler, adolescent, or teenager. 
and the last, which is actually used in this particular passage, which is not used a lot in the New Testament, but it is used in the Book of Romans, is the uh, definition mature or maturing. So we have those four that the word son is translates into infant, toddler, adolescent, or teenager, and the word mature. Okay. So if we were to reread verse 14, it says, For as many as are constantly led, constantly led by the Spirit of God, these are the maturing sons of God. See that? So they're not just sons, we are, they, they are the maturing. So if you are led by the Spirit constantly, then you are the maturing son of God. You're not the adolescent. Yeah. You're not the toddler. Yes. You're not the infant. You are the maturing son of God. And this is something that, as the body of Christ, we got to get to a point to. So within the body of Christ, or I guess within the world, there are really about four different groups. As a disclaimer, I may say some things today that may hurt somebody's feelings. Don't talk to me after. It's true. It's tight, but it's right. Right. Yes, sir. Oh, man. <laughs> so as the body of Christ, or outside of the body of Christ, there are about four different groups and categories. Let's go over what it like. We have the unsaved. Okay. And then from the unsaved, uh, hopefully, those individuals will become saved. So then when we become saved, now we have another category, which is the newly saved. So first group we have is the saved, excuse me, the unsaved. The next group, once they become saved, we have the newly saved believers. Okay? The newly saved believers, this is biblical, can be found in the book of James. Right? So the book of James, New Testament, uh, which is actually the first book that is written in the New Testament, would be good if you are discipling someone new into the kingdom of God. Okay? It doesn't play around. It's, it's, it's a New Testament wisdom. It's good though. After we see that, or from that, we begin to transition into another book, and to the carnally minded saved. The carnally minded saved can be found in 1 Corinthians. Right? So when we think about uh, the church of Corinth, Apostle Paul was writing to that, writing to the church of Corinth, uh, they were a very carnally minded body of people, so they were pagans. The interesting thing that was that throughout their past religious beliefs or traditions that they practiced, and even still, as Paul was writing to them, they were still living in sin, is that you saw miraculous and marvelous things yes. happen in that church. There was a lot of manifestations of the Holy Spirit in that church, First Corinthians uh, chapter 12, talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And it's really, it's really not gifts, it's really just spirituals. That word gifts is not really there. And if you want to take it even further, it's not gifts, like, I would give you something. It's more of a manifestation. Because really there's only one gift, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. So yes, once you sir. receive the gifting of the, amen. Once you receive the gifting of the Holy Spirit, then you get the package of all of these manifestations. So yes. then you get words of knowledge. And you get words of wisdom, then you prophesy, and you get faith, and you speak it in tongues, interpretation of those tongues, the, the gifts, the gifts of healing and, and the working of miracles. So they're not just like a gift. And, and I'm gonna just go ahead and kill, kill this cow right now. Sacred cow, a tradition of man. Jesus called him later on. Uh, the apostle Paul called him uh, doctrines of devils. Is that all of these manifestations? Because you have the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. They are inside of you, meaning that you just don't have one gift. Right. So all of these, I call them CCCs, Confused Covenant Christianity, uh -huh. that say that, oh, you have this one gift. You have the gift of prophecy. You have the gift of the little words of knowledge. You have the gift of working of miracles. No, brother, you got all of them. It's just a matter of manifesting them, those gifts. Yes. Right? Let's go ahead and kill that cow right there. All right, cow dead. There we go. No. <laughs> All right. So that's the carnally mind. So again, starting at the beginning, four groups. So the first group, unbelievers. Unbelievers become saved. They receive salvation. Uh, then we have the new believers found in the book of James. 
And then thirdly, we have the carnally minded believers found in 1 Corinthians. And lastly, my favorite, we have the spiritually minded believers found in the book of, of Romans, specifically Romans chapter 8. So this is what we're talking about. This is the point that I'm trying to make and the foundation I'm trying to set is that as the body of Christ, we've got to get to a point where we are keeping in step with the spirit. Yes. That we are walking in the spirit every single day because it's not about religion. And I know that the apostles of this church have talked about that. They are absolutely correct. It is not about a religion. Either. Yes. It's about a relationship. It's about a walk. Right now, I'm connected with my Heavenly Father. Right now. And all of you are the same. Because it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. So we got to get to a point where we're just, when we're walking in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, constantly walking in the Spirit, walking. And it's not so loosely walking in the spirit where it's just like a carefree type of life even though it is easy because Jesus says my, my yoke is easy right but it's just a walk it's just a walk in the spirit just a walking in the spirit so there should be a point in our spiritual life in our spiritual growth that we should get to where whatever I say the Holy Spirit backs me up every single time wherever whatever I do the Holy Spirit backs me up every single time I see somebody in a wheelchair I see somebody, I see a cripple, somebody who's lame, somebody who has a walker, that's all right. I just go right to him, grab him by the right hand, pick him up, get on out. Why? Because the Bible said I lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yes. Holy Spirit backs me up. Yes, sir. So there should be a point where we're just walking in the Spirit. We're just walking in the Spirit. We're just walking in the Spirit. We're just walking. We are led by the Spirit. And, and I just want to make this disclaimer when I say led by the Spirit. We don't necessarily need a lead in to go pray for somebody. We don't necessarily need to lead in to cast out a devil. Why? Because we've already been given that commission, Mark 16. Yeah, yeah. So you go out into and you go out into the world and preach the gospel. You go lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You shall cast out a demon. Jesus speaking out of no languages. So I don't need a lead in to see that. I, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I think it was last week, last week Thursday. My girlfriend and I was at a gas station. I saw this homeless people. Oh, uh, homeless, yeah, homeless people. And I said, let's go pray for them. I didn't need to lead in or had to pray about it. Oh, Lord, what do you want me to do about this homeless person? I don't need to do that. Right. I'm just going to do it. Just do it. So we did it. We did it. We prayed for them. Commanded their two of them, actually. Commanded the back pain to leave. Commanded the ankle or foot pain to go. Right? There was a little decrease. And then we didn't get about five feet from that going into the gas station. They called out to us and said, hey, all pain gone. So I just want to make that disclaimer because we don't need to lead in and go pray for people because we've already been, been given the command. Jesus said, go. Go. In the military, you don't question the command. Yes, sir. When your commanding officer gives you an order, you do it. You don't question it. Oh, well, you know, I don't, let me pray about this. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, you, you go. Right. So the general, in this sense, the king, the Lord, the general's already spoken. You just go. Yeah. And then watch him work. And that is awesome. Amen. All right. Amen. Spiritually minded. Okay. Spiritually minded people. There should be a point in our spiritual growth where we should get to being spiritual minded. And again, I'm planting the seed because the more that you keep in step with the spirit, the more God will just download things to you, download things to you. He'll just give you, again, that manifestation of words of knowledge, manifestation of prophecy, the gift of prophecy. I'm not talking about the fivefold ministry. I'm talking about the gifts, the gift of prophecy, being able to exhort, being able to edify, being able to comfort, the gift of prophecy. You can just do this easily. And that's just really encouragement. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's... Um, Let's keep going. So everyone's everyone's good with that, right? Yes. So there should be a point where we should just get to a point where we are we are spiritual minded. There there is a time, and and the way spiritual growth, the way spiritual growth looks like, or in comparison to natural growth, is completely different. Spiritual growth and natural growth are two different things. Amen. Amen. Natural growth. When you have a toddler to become older or get older into teenage or adolescent years, obviously there's a transition in, in, in behavior and there's a transition in age. That's natural growth. 
the 35-year-old you right now should not be the same as the 25-year-old you right now. The 35-year-old year old you right now should not be the same as the 15-year-old you. So there's a growth, there's a natural, there's a natural progression. And if there is something, if, there, if, if you're still the same, that you were, you're 35, you're still the same at 25, I want you to come down front right now so I can hands up. Or just see me after this. All right, so it should not be, so there's a natural, there's a natural growth. But spiritual growth is different from natural growth. It doesn't necessarily relate to age. Spiritual growth, you can be in a church for 25 years. You can be saved for 25 years and still be a baby. Let me try this side of the room. You can be in a church for 25 years and be saved for 25 years and still be a baby. So spiritual growth is different from natural growth. And if you want to grow in the spirit, if you want to walk in the spirit, if you want to keep in step with the spirit, it's going to take a certain amount of grit. It's going to take a certain amount of, of hunger, of spiritual hunger. When we think about the manifestations of the spirit in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul also talks about you shall desire these things, desire the gifts. That word desires means lust after. So don't lust after Netflix. Don't lust after Facebook. You lust after God. And you lust after walking in the Spirit. Amen? Amen? So spiritual growth is different from natural growth. And there's a desire that has to happen. Yes, sir. Yes. There's a desire that has to happen. Yes. I'm great. You are in the kingdom of God. Amen. Blessings. All right, we get you started with the book of James. We decide to do that. You don't always have to, but book of James. Let's start with the book of James. And then from James, then you should build yourself up. You should, you should progress into things like Galatians. You should progress into things like the book of Ephesians. Progress into things like the book of Romans. You can't just stay in the book of James the whole time, brother. Amen. At some point, you got to have this desire to move forward. So again, spiritual growth, in order to walk in the spirit every single day, because it's not about our religion, it's a relationship. In order to walk in the spirit every single day, there is a certain hunger, a certain grit that should take place. The same amount of effort that you put on your job to perform, to get this promotion from man. And God clearly says that Promotion does not come from the east or the west, nor the, the south or the north, but it comes from God. So you're putting all this energy into getting this promotion, getting this raise, this raise and pay to make a certain amount of money on another man's job. And this is not my sermon, but it fits. And to another man's job, see this is walking in the spirit, and to another man's job, then you can take that same amount of focus and put towards God's word and walk in the spirit. Spiritually minded, spiritually minded people. There's a, there's a level, there's a level, there should be a level that we should get to, a breaking point. It hurts, absolutely it hurts. Will God stretch you? Yes. Will we stretch? Will you have to step up? Absolutely you have to step up. I just mentioned about the words of knowledge. I haven't always interpreted the message correctly, but I step out and I give it. I would rather give a word of knowledge and allow me to be wrong, in a sense, or interpret the message incorrectly, then not give the word of knowledge. Because that person who I can give the word of knowledge to, I can invite them into the kingdom. And so we can continue to advance the kingdom. Because it's about a kingdom. It's not a religion. It's about a kingdom. And demolish the works of the kingdom of darkness. Push back the kingdom of darkness. Amen? So let's keep going. Verse 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the, received the spirit of adoption. In, in the Greek, when we, again, talking about the Kenneth Weiss, when we look that up, that, um, that is actually taken out, and it says, uh, receive, but you receive the spirit who places you as adult sons. Well, what do you know? 
adult sons, mature sons. Okay? So let's read in the Greek. But you receive the Spirit who places you as adult sons, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Amen. What do you know? Amen. The sons of God. So that's the second time in the book of Romans that it mentions the sons of God. And again, here we're talking about the mature sons. We can back that up, right? Because we saw in the previous scripture, the scripture uh, in verse 15, where we, when I read it in, from the original <laughs> Greek, it says that, but who you receive the, the spirit who places you as an adult son. So it's, it's something, it, apparently uh, the writer of, of Romans is trying to get something across to us about being mature sons of God. Because you are no longer, you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. Say it again. You are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You are a son. Yeah. A son or daughter of the living God. Yes, 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 sir. So when you when you when you go to the Father and you bring your needs and you cry out, Oh Lord, you know I got rent due next week. Oh Lord, what are you gonna do? God's like, I'm gonna provide for you. Yeah. Haven't I always provided for you? Yes, Lord. Why are you begging? Why? Because the, the word in Philippians 4 says, My God shall, there we go, shall, so the word shall, there's no vacillating on the word shall. My God shall provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory of Christ Jesus. Yes. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. I can stop right here and go home, but I won't. Man, this is good. This yes. is good. Hey, Stephen, is this good? Yes, sir, this is good. All right, this is good. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it, yes, is. it, is. Yes, it is. So there's something about being a son of God. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You are a son. We have to get to the point where we get past the cross to the throne, past the cross to the throne, yeah. past the cross to the throne. Yeah. It says it right here, we are heirs, not only heirs, but we are joint heirs with Christ. Amen. We are joint heirs with Christ. So in, in order to do that, and, and I wasn't going to go here, but I'm, I'm going to go here anyway. Um, in order to do that, there is a point of, of understanding who we are in Christ. Okay, so, so, there's, so there's an identification. There's an identification crisis going on right now by Christ. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like that step. Absolutely. See how I did that? I worked it up and I backed it right to the corner. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. So there's a there's a there's an identification identification crisis that is happening in the body of Christ right now because most people don't identify with Christ. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know the power and authority that they have. And I'm not even talking about the power of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about just basic dominion power. You can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 23 through 26. Yeah. And God says, well, let us create man in the likeness of our image. Yes. Let yes. us give them dominion over everything on earth. Everything that, that, that creeps on the earth, that all the birds in the air, all the fish in the sea. Yes. So let's, let's go back to the beginning. beginning, right? So we have that dominion power. So there's an identification crisis. But let's see why. Again, I just want to shoot another sacred cow. Uh, why we have a, a identification crisis, and again, setting the foundation for us to be able to clearly receive prophetic words, dreams, visions, tones, and interpretations of that, right? We don't, we don't want to put any boundaries on God. No boundaries on God. No boundaries on God. He can do anything. All right. 
So let's have everyone turn with me to the book of Corinthians, specifically 2 Corinthians. All right, so let's go to verse 3, excuse me, chapter 3. Um, let's start at verse 2. Yep, so chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, verse 2. Uh, it says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. What was written on tablets of stone? The law. Yeah. The law of Moses was written on tablets of stone. And I, I'm, I'm sending you up again. I'm setting you up for the layup, so be ready when I pass you the ball and you get there. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. But on tablets of flesh, that is on the heart. Let me read uh, verse 3 again. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. What was written on tablets of stone? The law. The law of Moses, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. Amen. This is a, a great illustration of two covenants, of what most people get caught in in the body of Christ. This is why we have the identity crisis. This is why a lot of people feel as if they uh, can't hear from God nowadays, and God is clearly speaking to them. They just have to listen to Him. Right? But we're going to shoot another sacred cow right now. Is that that's a beautiful illustration of what covenant we live in. We don't live in the old covenant anymore. We live in a new covenant. Amen. With better promises. We live in a new covenant with better promises. Amen. That book just said it. We can go to the book of Hebrews. We can prove it in the book of Hebrews. We do not live in the old covenant anymore. We live in a new covenant. So now you have people in the body of Christ who is trying to live up to a certain standard when that standard is not for you in the first place. That's how God dealt with people back then. That's how God dealt with people back then. There was a certain, there was a certain standard. But, but we don't have to live up to that to a certain degree anymore, right? So back then, when we think about the law or the commandments, some say 613, 621, between their commandments. And then what did God do? God said, all right, you know what? I'm just going to make him the Ten Commandments. And then Jesus came along and he says, he's got to do two things. Love God, love your God, with all your what? With all your heart? Mind. With all your mind? And your soul. And with all your soul, amen. And then the second thing Jesus said to do Love thy neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if I love my neighbor as myself, I don't have to worry about committing adultery because it's written on where? My heart. I don't have to go to a checklist every single day. Hmm. Let's see, I didn't murder today. I didn't commit adultery today. I didn't check that off. Did it lie today? I didn't steal it. No. And, and, am I, understand what I'm saying? I am not debunking or belittling the Ten Commandments. No, I'm not doing that. Because Jesus himself even said, he said, even if you look at a woman with less than the eye, you are from this. I'm not doing that. But what I'm saying is we don't have to use it as a checklist and have to approach the Father. If we do do something wrong, we don't have to approach the Father as a beggar. Amen. We're just going to come, because we're in a relationship, it's not a religion. We're just going to come to the Father, hey, you know what? I'm not living right now. He says, okay. And keep moving. Yeah. Because we live in a new covenant with better promises. Amen. Amen. I hear so many people say, Oh, we need the we need the days of Elijah back. We need the days of Elijah back. Why do you want the days of Elijah back? <laughs> Elijah is an Old Testament prophet. We have the power of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit living in you. Yes, Elijah didn't even have the Holy Spirit. Come on. 
You can do greater works. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. So again, the, the reason I, the reason I say that is because we want to be able to debunk mm -hmm. and move forward, begin to walk in the fullness of Christ. Amen. 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 We gotta get to that point. So if we still hold on to these, and I know this is a very forward church, right? That's why I love you guys. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get to a point. If we if we continue to hold on to the old, then we never be able to fully transition into the new. Amen. If you hold on to the old, you can never transition into the new. It's like moving into a new relationship, right? So you get in a new relationship, and you're still holding on to things of the past relationship. You're not giving yourself fully to the person in your relationship. Amen? Amen. You can't hold on to the old and expect to receive from the new. You just like that. Go ahead. You can't. It doesn't work, people. So, all right. Um, let's keep reading. So, let's go all the way down. I'm going to skip some of this. Let's go all the way down to verse 7. Right? It says, but if the ministry of death. So, now, Paul switches things. And he, he's referring to the law of the tablets written on stone, as we saw previously in verse 3. He switches it, and he calls it the ministry of death. He says, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, the law, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily on the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. Verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So what Paul is saying is, if, 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 if that was the ministry, and again, he's referring to the ministry of death. The ministry of death, if it was good, then you know what? This one that we live in is even better. Amen. For if the ministry of condemnation, for the ministry of condemnation, had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So, if you continue to try to live by the law and use it as a checklist, again, I'm not debunking, but use it as a checklist every single day, and you begin to put yourself in a box, then you're going to do what? Paul says, hey, you're going to fall into condemnation. Amen. Condemnation for the Christian. Condemnation is like kryptonite for the Christian. Condemnation yes. will keep you from moving forward in your spiritual growth. Yes, sir. When you mess up, when you get into sin, what happens? Condemnation. So the enemy, <laughs> the enemy is so, it, it, not to talk up the works of the devil because his methods, his wiles, as the Bible describes him, doesn't change. John 10, 10 tells us that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I came to give you life and love and love it. So steal, kill, and destroy. Right? So the enemy, what he will do, Satan will, will keep poking and poking and poking and pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to provoke you to do that thing that you're not supposed to do. And then, oh, you know what? You do it. He says, ah, I got you. Right. And then what happened? You get into condemnation. And then when you fall into condemnation, what happens? You shrink back. Yep. So when you fall into condemnation, you feel guilty. And you feel like, well, I can't preach the gospel. I can't minister to anybody. Yeah. Look at what I did. So, so, so the next time you see a homeless person and God gives you a word of knowledge for that homeless person, you say, God, I can't do it. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not living the way I'm supposed to live. And so what do you fall into? You fall into condemnation. And you shrink back. And the enemy's like, yes, I got you. Because you didn't give that word of knowledge. That word of knowledge probably would have brought that homeless person into the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So true. Just, just, I'm just, just building you up. I'm trying to walk with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, constant, keeping in step with the Spirit, constant is keeping in step with the Spirit. Condemnation is like the kryptonite to a Christian. If you want to develop in your spiritual growth, don't fall into condemnation. Now, am I saying sin is wrong? Is sin is good? No, don't sin. Romans chapter 6 says that. 
But when I when you do sin, or if you do sin, you have an advocate. Yes. You have an advocate. So let's go back. I just set you up. Let's go back to the book of Romans. It looks like I'm coming to an end on time here. So I'm going to speed this up. Let's go back to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of Romans, uh, verse 1. It says that there is therefore now no condemnation. Yes, Lord. So the ministry of death that we just saw in 2 Corinthians with condemnation. It's, we see the same thing here. If we fall into that trap of the enemy of condemnation, we're not we're not living in the fullness of God. And what the writer of Paul here, excuse me, the writer of Roman is saying that there is therefore no condemnation, because condemnation will allow you to shrink back to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. Let's go down to, uh, to verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So, so how do we get to a point where we're just constantly keeping in step with the Spirit and walking with the Spirit? We just read it. For those who set their minds flesh. Set the minds on the flesh. Yes, sir. Where is your mind? It's in your soul. Because you are a three-part being. You are a spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. You are a three-part being. Just like God is a three-part being, you are a three-part being as well. Our mind is in our soul. Because what is our soul? Our souls are mind, will, emotions, and also imaginations. So if, if your mind is constantly set on things of the flesh, you can't walk in the spirit. Amen. Thank you for that resounding amen. <laughs> if your mind is set on the things of the flesh, you can't walk in the spirit. Yes, sir. So true. So whatever you focus on affects the spirit. Amen. Whatever you focus your mind on, your thoughts, your imagination, affects how you walk in the spirit. For those individuals who uh, like to hunt or who have been around guns, uh, was growing up, my dad occasionally took me hunting. Never was really good at it. Fishing, great. Great at fishing. But one of the things that I learned is that one of the most important part of a weapon, in this case a gun, is not the bullet. It is not the trigger. It's not the muzzle. It's the sight. Most important part of a weapon or a gun is the sight. But why is the most important part of a weapon is the sight? I'm glad you asked. Because it directs where the bullet goes. Right. Wherever you set your sight on, that's where the bullet is going to go if your sight is aligned right. You can't set your sight over here and the bullet goes all the way over here. Right, right. I can set my sight over here and the bullet goes all the way over there. 
Unless I'm like, what, Fred Sanford or something, I don't know. No, I can't. And it's the same way in your life. Whatever you put your focus on, that's where you will go. If you put your focus on fleshly things, then you will go towards fleshly things. You cannot cannot spend three, four, five hours binging on Netflix and expect to walk in the spirit. You cannot spend three, four, five hours talking on the phone with your friend, gossiping, and expect to get revelations from God. You can, to a degree, you can, but we have to keep our minds set on the eternal constantly, every single day. So the same amount of time that you spend talking on the phone, binging on Netflix, three, four, five hours on Facebook, close it down, pull out your Bible. Close it down, go speak in your heavenly language. And get the revelation that you need. Instead of calling your, your girlfriend and saying, oh, you know, I got this problem with my boyfriend, I got this problem with my husband, and he does this, and he does that, and he does this, and he does that. How about instead of getting that advice, you go to your Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, I'm about to pray in my spirit, or pray in the spirit for revelation, give me the revelation. That's all you gotta do. You don't have to make this all. And then you begin to pray in the spirit. Amen, amen. And he gives you the revelation. Yes, sir. Simple. Simple. Walking with the Spirit, man. Hearing the voice of God. Hearing the voice of God. There was a, there was a, uh, this, is, this is old, how I know it. Uh, it's just because of, of my uncle. There was a comedian, I think it was back in the 70s. There was a comedian by a gentleman named uh, Flip Wilson. Yeah. I heard of Flip Wilson. Yes, yes. And so Flip <laughs> would have this, 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 um, this skit. Uh, where he would say, oh, the devil made me do it. He would always say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And so, unfortunately, Christians, we thought, man, that's cool. Flip Wilson said it. I'm going to say the same thing. So why do you do this? Oh, the devil made me do it. Oh, wow. oh, why, do you, why do you become angry? The devil made me do it. Wow. Why do you have fits of rage? The devil made me do it. Right. And the thing is, brother, the devil didn't make you do it. It's what you focus on, your mind. Yes, sir. And so yes, people, sir. so Christians got to the point, and this is why we have to raise up. We have to, we just got to get to a point in our Christianity where we are seeking, seeking the kingdom, constantly seeking the kingdom, seeking the kingdom. See, the word seek, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the word seek uh, in the Greek is detail. Means like you have to actively pursue it. You have to actively pursue the kingdom. And this is why, as a body of Christ, we got to continue to actively pursue the kingdom. Actively pursue the kingdom. So no longer, should, no longer within our walk with God, should we constantly say, "All oh, the devil made me do it. All the devil made me do it." And I'm not. There are some things. That can be or can transition into demonic influence, right? I've cast a couple of devils on myself. So there are some things that can become demonic influence. But there are a lot of things that are just your flesh, man. Galatians yeah. chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 talks about the things of the flesh, the workings of the flesh. Talks about rage or fits of anger. Talks about bitterness. Yes, sir. Talks about witchcraft. It's the things of the flesh. Now, the devil can use that. He certainly can use that. But these are still words of the flesh. So again, there should be a point in time where we just got to separate what's happening in the flesh and what's happening in the spirit so we can truly function in the spirit so we can be able to truly hear the voice of God. And don't worry if you get it wrong. If you, if, if, if you 
get the interpretation of the tongues slightly wrong or words of knowledge slightly wrong. Maybe you want to prophesy to someone's life slightly wrong. That's all right to say, hey, I'm practicing here from God. Can I practice on you? And most of the time, people will say, okay. If you live in the South, maybe in the North is a little tricky. <laughs> and they don't mind. Amen? Amen. Right, so let's, let's wrap this up. This is good. Yes, sir. Uh, are, are you getting anything out of this? Good. So I'm going to finish reading that. Verse 5, Romans chapter 8. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. So whatever you focus on, that's where your sight is going to go. So you cannot focus on the things of this world constantly and expect to walk in the Spirit. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let's finish up with this. We'll jump all the way down to verse 11. It says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, Lord have mercy, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies. Yes, sir. Through His Spirit who dwells in you. So another way of looking at that, the word gives, the words give life, would be quickened. So we can reread that and it says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies through His Spirit to dwell in you. The Word of God will change your mortal body. The Word of God will change your mortal body. Getting into the Word of God, allowing the Word of God to get into you, having a relationship, not a religion, with our Father will change your mortal body. And we see this. We see this in uh, we see this in Abraham. So God approached Abraham, cut Abraham a deal. Say, hey man, I want to cut you a deal. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. You're going to have this child at your age. Your wife is going to give birth at this age, blah, 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 blah. Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah, his wife, 90 years old. God cut that deal with him. So it got to the point where, where that word uh, that, that God gave was so strong, was so strong that it quickened. It quickened Abraham's body. And it also quickened Sarah's body. To, to just change something within her. Change her physiology. Change it. Just like that. Yes, God's word. Bang, get you. Oh. Get you. <laughs> you, know, you guys have to like receive a word like that. <laughs> Stop patting your head. Right. <laughs> it will quicken your mortal body. It will change your physiology. Yes, sir. And so that's what happened with the word. It, it, the, the Bible even says that 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 Sarah was changed so much that during that time, can't remember who the king was. The king wanted to to marry Sarah. A ninety-year-old woman. Now, in the natural, there's no, there's no king in his right mind want to go search out a 90-year-old woman. But apparently, that word had quickened her spirit so much that it changed something in her. And you guys know the rest of the story. So the same can happen with you. The same can happen with you. With getting into the presence of God, getting into the word of God, allowing the word of God getting into you, and walking in the flesh, the same thing can happen to you. It can hit you so hard. It can resonates so well with your spirit and then it just changes you. It's almost like a seed. You take a seed and you place the seed in the ground. And so what is not said or what is not seen is that that seed will begin to vibrate the ground around it. That seed begins to vibrate the ground around it. Begins to resonate the ground around it. And then eventually it sprouts up. That's the same way that the Word of God in the presence of God and walk in the spirit of you. You get the, you get the yes, word of God in you. You take the word of God. Yes, sir. Let's say you take a three by five card and you take a scripture. 
Someone give me a scripture. Those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Yes. Thank you, brother. All right. You take that scripture and you place it in your mirror in the bathroom. And every time you brush your, brush your teeth, you know, uh -huh. those who walk in the Spirit are the sons of God. Those who walk in the Spirit are the sons of God. You take another three by five card and you place it in your car. Maybe like uh, tape it on the dashboard or something like that. And every time you have a stop, like when you are, you're out. <laughs> Praying the Spirit while you're driving, but you don't look at it. Keep your eyes on the road. And, and every time you have a stop, like, ah, I'm reading the scripture. Those that walk, those that walk in the Spirit, those that walk in the Spirit are, are the sons of God. Those that walk according to the Spirit are the sons of God. Those that walk according to the Spirit. And, if, and, and, and you take a, another three by five card, and then you get the word. And you put that on your desk. And every time you get a work, every time you get a break, you're looking over. Ah, those that walk according to the Spirit of the Son of God. Those that walk according to the Spirit of the Son of God. And then eventually, that word, which is the seed, begins to resonate. Bang! Hits your spirit. And then you just start walking. And then you just walk in the office and people are like, why is this person so different? It's that seed that you planted. And then you just begin to start, you don't even notice it. You just begin to start walking in the Spirit, just keeping in step with the Spirit, just prophesying to people's lives, giving them words of encouragement, giving them words of comfort. And they're like, wow, oh, you're, you're, you're really changed. What happened to you? Because I'm walking in the Spirit. Amen. You know what, brother? You can walk in the Spirit, too. Yes, I do. Then you bring somebody into the body of Christ, into the kingdom. Amen? So now you get somebody else saved. And this is how it works because we want to make disciples. And when those disciples we make more disciples. Amen. Amen. Anybody get anything out of this today? Yes. So again, just, Absolutely. just setting the tone. Just setting the tone for being able to receive. Because next Sunday, we're going to dwell, delve in a little bit more. Talking about dreams and visions. And tongues and interpretations of that. And then again... Just getting to the point where now that we have the foundation set and this is the way that we should think, this is the way that our actions, our actions should revolve around this as well as keeping in step with the Spirit. And then just watch the revelations that you will get. I challenge you. So here's a challenge. Between now and next Sunday, I challenge you to take a book and go to Walmart or whatever and get a little notepad. And place it by your bed. And before you go to bed, just say, God, I want to receive more revelations. I want to be able to receive more dreams from you and interpretation of those dreams for something that I have going on in my life. Whether that's relationship struggles, whether that's something going on at work, or whatever. And then watch the dreams that God did. And write these down. And as soon as you have it, as soon as you have it, you get up and you write it down. You get up and you write it. Because the longer dreams are so interesting, When you, the longer you wait, dreams are like ice cubes. They begin to melt away. And if someone asks you later on, um, or you, you mention to someone, you know, I had this interesting dream. And they say, well, tell me about it. I can't tell you about it. The dream, they, they fade away. They're like ice cubes. I finish with this. I love saying that I finish with this and I don't finish with it. I was, I was traveling back uh, from Wisconsin and I stopped at a gas station and to take a nap in my car. Um, I went inside the gas station, came out, uh, and as I was coming out, I saw a young lady and to be honest with you, I'm not an always obedient. So this message is for me as well. To God was telling me to speak to this young lady, one of the cashiers. I didn't do it. So I went in my car. I said, God, I'm tired. I'm going to go in my car. I'm going to sleep. All right. Well, I thought that I was finished. But God wasn't finished. Right? <laughs> He's like, No, I want you to speak, man. Um, like, yeah, I want you to speak. So I woke up. I had it from a very interesting dream, and. Uh, and I saw the young lady again walking across the parking lot. And instantly it just hit me. God reminded me to go speak to this young lady. Because this particular young lady was in my dream. So I go inside, speak to the she's at the counter, I wait my turn, I go up to her, 
and I said, I'm a traveling minister, and I just stopped here outside to take a nap. And as I'm dreaming, uh, I had a dream, and you were in the dream. And she was like, okay. <laughs> That's a good lead-in, right? I said, no, 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 don't, you know, don't be afraid. Like, like God speaks through dreams, right? Like, like God gives me, you know, information about people, and he speaks through dreams. And a lot of times, we're going to tell people something. I said, so do you mind if I uh, kind of chat with you a little bit about the dream or, or whatever? And she said, yeah. And then I began to, again, we're at the, at the, at the uh, counter. And then I began to share with her what the Lord shared with me through my dream. Specifically talking about, so in the dream, she had like some type of hip stuff going on. Every time she walked, it was almost like she swung her leg. It was a limp leg. And so I saw that in my dream. And then so I, when I began to minister to her, I just told her that, um, that what the Lord showed me in the dream was that there was some back pain or some hip stuff going on. When you have back pain or any kind of uh, movement uh, challenges with your hip, she said, yes, I do. I said, is it, on the, is it on the right side and does it trickle down into the hip? She said, yes. This is from the dream. I said, okay. I said, uh, I said, you know what? I said, God wants to heal that now. Are you going to let him heal that? And she said, yeah. I said, okay, great. Because <laughs> I want to do it. All right. And it's not me doing it, right? I don't do it through my power and my authority. I do it through Jesus, right? But I'm his hands and feet, right? So we go all the way over to the drink counter. And then I asked her first. I said, are you a believer? She says, no. You know, I was once in the church, but then some things happened. Um, I said, that's all right. It, whether you believe or not a believer, so God still is going to heal you. Amen. And then I'm looking for a chair because I asked her, I said, the Lord is revealing to me that you have uh, one leg longer or shorter than the other one. Have you ever been to a chiropractor? She said, no, but it's kind of, you know, I kind of feel, sometimes I do feel different when I'm standing. I said, great. Look for a chair. Couldn't find a chair. I said, uh, okay, that's all right. Sit on the drink counter. So she hops on the drink counter. And then I bring her legs up, hold her heels, just have her heels placed softly in my hand. And then I show her, right? So now I'm dipping into what I do in the natural, but then bringing it into the spirit. And then I show her that there was, there was a, a, one, of her, one of her legs were long in the shoulder. When she saw it, she was like, oh, wow, yeah. Right? I don't remember specifically which leg it was, but I know one was shorter. Or longer. So I said, all right, God is going to heal that right now. You ready? And yep, and I said, you also got some, some knee pain. Now that I think about it, I was on the right leg. I said, you also got some knee pain, but I was going to take care of that at the same time. Began to minister to it, began to pray, and command that leg to grow in the name of Jesus. All the vertebrae, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, pelvic, hips come in line, grow. Knee pain, go, right now in the name of Jesus. The leg grew. And I'm not tugging on the leg, because I don't want to take anything from God. It's not about me. I'm just his hands there. I just got to put my hands there. I shall lay hands on my seat and they shall recover. And the leg grew. And I recheck. You know, who's my favorite. Right? I said, you see that? I said, you see that? She was like, I said, come on, sister. Talk to me. And she's like, I don't know what to say. I said, well, hop down off the counter, sister. So she hopped down off the counter. And I said, well, how do you feel? Tell me. She said, it's different. I feel even. She said, even as you were, even as you were praying, I felt ting, bang, just go down my whole spine. It felt like like a chill, just go down the whole spine. And then later on, I prophesied to her and, and just kind of ministered her back into the kingdom, told her she needed to get into a good church, a good forward message church, and things of that nature. And um, yeah, so here's the thing: again, God speaks through dreams and visions, we get tons of interpretations, and Jesus wants to heal people, Jesus wants to speak to people, but as long as the body of Christ, as we just stand there, and we don't want to ruffle anybody's feelings, and we don't want to feel ashamed, what if I'm here wrong, what if I'm not healing from the fear from the Holy Spirit, no oh, man, just step up, because the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit will want Because 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, right? He who is joined with the Lord is one in spirit. It's one. He's got to step out. 
So again, I challenge you all, get a notebook, uh, keep the notebook by your bed, and then write down your name. And then hopefully next Sunday we'll have the time to kind of talk about those. Uh, and then you know, we'll see what the Lord will do to you. Amen? Yeah, amen. amen. Yeah, so let's just, uh, let's just say a quick prayer. Uh, so Father God, um, I just proclaim and decree that right now in the name of Jesus, that you just open up this body of Christ's eyes, open up their, their hearts, and open up their ears to everything that King Jesus has for them. All of the riches and glory according to Christ Jesus. And we just proclaim right now. Whatever strife that is going on in people's lives right now, with their family and co-workers at work, right now in the name of Jesus. We just bind them. We bind them in the name of Jesus. Because your word says that whatever we loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth will be bind in heaven. In Jesus' name, we bind any tricks, any wiles, any methods any evil municipalities that the devil tried to try to place in our path, we bind that up right now in the name of Jesus. And I just proclaim this full healing, full healing, full healing, total body, total body from everybody that is in this room and everybody that is watching us via the web. Right now in the name of Jesus, you are being healed in the name of Jesus. If you receive that and you keep your healing in Jesus' name, depression, go. Anxiety, go right now in the name of Jesus. All pain, go. You are healed, you are whole, and you are made free. In Jesus' name, amen, and so be it. Thank you, church. Look forward to speaking with you all next week. Hope you got something out of this.